at least listed, because it's already a pretty big schedule. But first of all, have we really covered everything in terms of what we've been working on, what jumps out? And then, if so, then are there new things that should take our attention? Do we have time for them and so on? I don't have any new ideas at the moment. Uh, yeah. Does this miss anything? Is there anything that anybody sitting at the table has been working on that's related to climate that we've we, that isn't listed here? The only vague thought I have, and this really is vague, is that uh, Tammy town meeting just voted to um, support the uh, Paris Accord, and I'm wondering if there's anything in that that this committee. Well, I think that ties into the climate action plan. Yeah, the item number two down under the climate action plan specifically relates to that. Okay. So I think that's that, that's covered there. Um, well, I yes. just want to yes. say related to that item part. two, I think one of the areas that particularly needs attention is the adapt to the climate change risk group. We've got a few items in the climate action plan as it is now that we categorize from the old one, but it hasn't been developed at all. And that's something I'm personally interested in helping with. Um, okay. Well, we'll have to come up with a scheme for how we how we do this. Um, I guess the first question we have to ask is, do we want to do it ourselves, or how else would we do it? Um, I think. Uh, there are mem members of CAB who aren't members of this committee have offered to uh, help. So it might be one of those opportunities for uh, a joint effort, um, like we did on um, Net Zero. What? Net Zero. Net Zero, thank you. I was having a senior moment there. Thank you. Well, Chris, well, I think Maria has, you know, I mean, the other thing I feel like having. Having bearing uh, <laughs> responsibility or blame or whatever for the current plan, which is not a planner's plan so much, but, but having you know chair the subcommittee did that. I mean, I think we were kind of winging it. And one of the things that one of the questions is whether we really should rely on Maria more on staff more, whether we should again, you know, a lot of communities go out and hire a consultant to help put together a plan to really think about. All the, all the intricacies of planning, which I don't tend to understand. Um, is there some food for thought? Oh, when, when you're ready. Yep. The question is, do we, do we really have a budget for Well, here's, here's an idea. I think we can be efficient because of what's going on with the vulnerability assessment. So what is coming out of the vulnerability assessment is, is an action plan, um, really recommendations that will cut across the different functional areas. So we have a working group that consists of a cross-section of mm -hmm. uh, departments. But, but just within town government, right? Yeah, but, and I, I understand where you're going, but it, I mean, for instance, there's a huge responsibility that, that town government has if you want to prepare for, say, heat waves and ensure that there's data cooling centers. Um, there also could be idea around um, mitigation um, so it's, we're not saying it's strictly for um, town employee, I mean, um, municipal government, um, but the idea that that would be really huge because think of, think of the action plan that we have now. It's, it is geared more toward the community, but there's, it doesn't have as much teeth as if you, let's say you have an action plan, it could lead to regulations, it could lead to increased budgeting accountability. So something could come out of it that actually is, is even more measurable. So and, and I think what one of the things we should do is step back and go, yeah, maybe that was the weakness. Maybe this the, the plan that we did a few years ago is sitting on the shelf. We could go through it and say, yeah, some of the things that are in it as ideas have happened. They haven't really happened because they're in the plan. They happen because people in the community are doing things. And that maybe Maybe when we do this, it should be a whole different kind of plan. Maybe it should be really focused on the town government. And we should be really focused on, this group should be more focused on town government and, and let CAB and other people focus on the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I think that's a really big dis big discussion to have. You can't just let an easy answer to that. And, and keep in mind, it's not just town government. Like if there were a recommendation about um, maybe 
something having to do with greener buildings, if that were to eventually lead to updating like a zoning bylaw or maybe pr provisions for um, discussions when we have a major impact project, that affects the community because any regulations that you change are going to affect the community. So, um, so just keep in mind, it's not just holding town yeah. apartments, but there could be changes that actually affect the community at large. Well, I also think you could look at all of the um, items that are in there and maybe the implementation strategy gets more work or gets looked at in a different way. Another thing we wanted to recommend is there are things that the committee has done, as you can see in our annual report, there were a lot of things that the committee uh, accomplished. And we might want to look at the climate action plan with an eye to those initiatives. Does it reflect you know, we had an electric vehicle construction station study? That isn't really reflected in the climate action plan. It's recommended that the town will inc increase its fleet of electric vehicles, but that study actually has probably bigger implications, wider implications. So that's another thing to look at. Mm -hmm. um, what I could write, what I could probably um, send you is I'm going to be um, touching base with Ann Herbst at NAPC, who's working on the vulnerability assessment. And we'll get a schedule. She's hoping to have some working group meetings uh, in house. Um, so, and then coming up with the draft closer to August. So that but that's still the assessment stage, well, right? Well, it's the assessment home action plan. Now, I don't. Think that's what I have trouble understanding. Is that what this, uh, the action plan is? Yeah, we had been focusing on an assessment, but because NAPC lost some time. There was a change in personnel. They actually applied more resources to do uh, a, an action plan for us. Now, honestly, I don't know if it meets our expectations. That's the whole point of meeting the cross section of our, our working group to see if this is something that we expected as a town um, in terms of an action plan. But it is a start, and I think that. My experience with the first phase, when you present a vulnerability assessment but no action plan, you end up with a lot of frustrated mm -hmm. people. So we're going to try something a little different with phase two. Yeah, Michael, are you one of our two representatives? Are there two people from the, yeah, this group that I are am. you? Yeah, I am. Too. Yeah. Two. The issue you raised a minute ago, Nancy, about whether we, we, to how we, if we, can, if we coordinate it all with the cab people, <coughs> in terms of. The well, maybe what we need to do first is to look at vulnerability, look at our plan, kind of think about what kind of work and what kind of uh, how much is involved in doing the update. Probably things have changed. I mean, this is an area that's constantly changing because of technology. Well, the other thing, too, is like, what are we getting out of NAPC? I mean, how, how substantive will that be? So, I, that's, that's the I, vulnerability. Uh, well, it's the vulnerability with an action plan right. for mitigation and adaptation. Right. So, let's just see how good that is. Um, and, you know, if it's something that maybe it, it supersedes. The format that we have. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe what we could do, and I, I might ask you to do that, and maybe one other person, is to take a detailed look at the climate action plan and come back to us with a report saying, okay, we we need to update this part. We just a you know a planning tool basically to say we need we've done this much. We need to do this much more. Or whatever. Well, I also just wanted to say that we're just wrapping up the. Um, Warner and myself are representatives to the open space plan update, and there's a lot of climate things that are part of that. And I think what we need to do is coordinate so that these things that are showing up in different places somehow show up in ours, and so that that get these different people acting together rather than, than separate silos. That's, that's a good one. point. Yeah. yeah. Also about um, updating the. Um, 
the, the action plan. I would think instead of giving it to just one person, I, I think that should be sort of homework for the entire committee. Um, right. Well, I don't object to that. I'm just, I would like somebody to take it on as their, you know, well, what I was going to say sure is, that is this, I mean, you know, put it on the agenda for, say, September meeting, and, you know, we'll all be here and, and make sure that we all have at least electronic copies of it with an understanding that, you know, that, that we come voted for bear uh, at the September meeting. I don't have a problem with that time frame. Maria, uh -huh. when will the vulnerability assessment slash action plan? Yep. What is the target date for completion? The target date is early August, and then there would be a series of meetings presenting it to town meeting, advisory, climate action committee. There, there are activities. Um, even town meeting, even. Yeah, we, we I tentatively reserve time at town meeting. If you want, if you want to use that form, I, it was important that when we had the scope prepared, that we we had um, MAPC reserve time. Did Andy? Did Sandy agree to it? Sandy, the moderator. Yes, it, it wasn't something that I scoped out with anybody. It's just I. It doesn't have to be in town meeting. It can be concurrent. Um, it's up to you. I was I was more concerned with ensuring that MAPC would reserve time for at least three public meetings, different venues, mm -hmm. because it's important that they do have the outreach. It, it's not unusual for, for committees to actually give reports at the end of town meeting. Um, he stopped that practice. I tried to um, uh, get him to agree to uh, a green electricity report, in essence. Oh, okay. I didn't know so, which, which is something that town meeting did. <laughs> yeah, that's something town meeting did. It's like, mm. here's the result of what, here's the, the thing we came up with from what you asked us to do, and here's what we did. But, so instead we had the table outside, and Neil mm. mentioned it in his opening remarks, mm. and, you know, we did, we kind of, so, but, but Sandy, I think, feels that he does not want to be, have town meeting inundated, <coughs> with um, these kinds of reports. So he's reluctant. He, he's happy for you to include it in the, you know, we couldn't even get it in the supplemental because we didn't, right. it, the timing was so, so we did it at, at the tellers, which is fine. I mean, I, I wasn't totally unhappy with that, but, you know, that's basically, so he's not, and to tell you the truth, the vulnerability assessment is a pretty significant document. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's talking about what kinds of problems we anticipate for the community in the future. And it seems to me it ought to be, but it's not. So, um, unless we could persuade him to, to do it in this one instance. Or if, if there's a warrant article that's presented at town meeting that relates to <laughs> content, and then you can... Exactly right. Or if it was part of the selectmen's report, the selectmen still present a report. Actually, I wasn't going to say, I was actually wanted to make time to speak with the chairs first, but there is the CIP, which is getting yeah. worked on now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I talked to Allison and Kara um, because Al uh, Kara is actually, I think, uh, kind of coordinating that process. And it's with the planning board. And I, I wanted to have climate action initiatives have much more prominence in documents like this, whether it's a comprehensive master plan, a comprehensive plan, CIP, zoning. There's no mention of climate action or climate action plan. So just keep in mind, too, that that's also, there's something happening, I think, in October. So we should just really coordinate, and not just like wait for a warrant article, but work out of this committee, which is like on the ball. Is it, and, and you're saying it's part of the CIP process? Yeah, I mean, is there a way that, um, is there anything in the CIP that should should represent initiatives, anything that's come out of the vulnerability assessment? Do we, is there, is there anything like capital projects that have to, because it's, it spans five years. Yep. So I don't really know if there's anything like this action plan that would. Um, well, it's got to be an improvement to a building or. 
again, yeah, I just, I'm just i throwing it out there as just a general possibility. Yeah. Let's not overlook it. Let's be proactive. And to expand on that, I mean, the budget in general, for instance, right. staff time position, you know, which yes. we have talked about for a long time. But to, mm -hmm. to what extent is that the purview of this committee to be lobbying for um, recommending? Right, yeah, recommendations for for staff, I know. Yes, for, just to, to, to take that point further, in Boston they, they, they have one person whose position is essentially to attend every meeting. That it happens with all the different departments to be at the table, literally. And that's been, according to him, pretty effective. And so the climate always is kind of at the table. So that's a position. And it's climate specifically, not even broader no. sustainability. Is a, uh, sustainability planner? Or? There's, I think, a cabinet number. It's, um, yeah. Austin Blackman is like the head of energy. Oh, come in. Please have a seat. Hi. Well, I say, and I mean, that's very interesting because, first of all, you know, in a certain way, we're already on record because the climate action plan from 2012 raises this issue of, <coughs> of there being a staff presence somewhere. So it's already. In there a little bit, but that's a long time ago. And I mean, then the other thing is, there are people in the Green Caucus that are talking about exactly that issue. Um, it's really pretty independent of us, you know. I mean, in other words, some idea that's around there everywhere, right? <laughs> so um, the question is, how and when we uh, lend our voice to that idea? Well, for starters, we need to know the calendar for both the budget and the CIP. Um, when we need to get in there, if we're going to get in there. So. The CIP is happening now, yes. They started it already. Well, the point is they are. Yeah. But it seems like it might dovetail with our vulnerability assessment draft. Yeah. So it's probably it, in, uh, in last year's CIP, there were any number of items that were like ones that we would support, improving building efficiency mm -hmm. and this and that. Well, the minimum thing I think we should do, first of all, is thank you, Maria, for raising this. Because, in fact, talking about having something at the table, clearly you are thinking that way already. And we haven't had that in the past. So just the fact. So I guess what I would say at a minimum is that unless anybody disagrees here, we, you should feel authorized by us to keep thinking about that and to keep, uh, to, you know, to bring things back to us and to, and to say to people that, the, that this committee really feels like climate should be a part of that process, both in the CIP and in the budget, and and is that is there a consensus about that? Yeah, and uh, that's the first step. Um, it's almost six thirty, and we're going to go to our session on green electricity. But I want, since we didn't have a quorum before, and now we do, I want to uh, get a vote on the approval of the past minutes. Can we do that? Um, you all have that in front of you. This is from the meeting of April 24. Um, Sorry, do you think there's a pilot if you don't have it? So take a minute to, to look over it. And uh, we did not, as you recall, we did not have a meeting in May because of the town meeting and Memorial Day. So we're having this meeting now, and we will not have another one until July. Um, so we just knocked this off the, off the, off the list of things to do. before, please, uh, Maria will hand you a, uh, um, Will this presentation also be available online? 
Yes, it, it, it is online. The last page yeah. of this document contains some um, websites. In addition, um, there's a Morgan, Morgan actually is in the room, so it is being televised. Okay, so he's televising. We're, we're being uh, streamlined, and it will also be on the web at brooklineinteractive.org. Have you streamed? If not streamed right? What? <laughs> streamed, yeah. Did I say streamlined? <laughs> I like streamlined. <laughs> okay. It's hot. What can I say? <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone, our vast audience here. Hopefully, people are watching on TV. Um, thank you for coming. And this is a presentation about our program of Brookline Green Electricity, which is a municipal aggregation program, or community choice aggregation, as it's sometimes called. It was a, a program that was actually authorized by the state in 1997. And to provide rate stability at the time, that was the purpose, to provide rate stability to to uh, consumers of electricity. Uh, it began in, I think Melrose began the idea of using it to promote not only rate stability, but also renewable energy. And that happened in uh, a few years ago. In two, November of 2015, our town meeting voted to um, adopt, to uh, urge the selectmen to, to adopt a program um, which would reflect the commitment to renewable energy. This committee had a subcommittee which we worked very hard on. Now we started, uh, but we, as we looked at it, we realized we needed more than one product. We needed more options. Uh, so we have an option uh, which we call sort of the basic option, and that is comparable to Eversources, but because of the uh, fact that we were able to negotiate a very good rate, <coughs> our product will be a couple of dollars cheaper per month depending upon your usage. Uh, then we have the, pro the product that um, Brookline, that Town Meeting wanted us to adopt, and that is that we add 25% additional renewable energy to the, to the basic portfolio. And uh, that option will cost approximately $2 more a month and will be tax deductible that the portion that you pay for renewable energy is tax, federally tax deductible because we're doing it through massenergy.org, which is a nonprofit organization. And then we have a, a program for 100% renewable energy, uh, also through massenergy.org. Also, the payments to that will be tax deductible. Now, I'm sorry to steal Not Maria's thunder, but I just it's wanted to give you a, re a really quick overview of it. Um, and you will also able to opt out at any time. So uh, that was a great introduction. Thank you, Selectman right. Heller. Um, I want to introduce myself. I'm Maria Morelli. I'm a senior planner in the Department of Planning and Community Development, and I work with the Selectman's Climate Action Committee on climate actions for the town. Uh, there was a committee, as Selectman Heller uh, stated, it was chaired by Werner Lowy. Uh, to Selectman Heller's right, and it consisted of uh, John Weitzman, uh, David lesko uh Kathleen Scanlon, uh, and Alan Leviton. And we also, uh, we were also attended with uh, Selectman Heller. She was at every one of our meetings and was quite a force. Thank you for your leadership. We also had advisors. Uh, Tommy Vitola was one of the citizen petitioners for the, the town meeting warrant article regarding the 25% option. And Ed Leckler was also very involved. And we've, we've also had dedicated citizens actually coming into the room right now, David Pantalone, John Harris, and Mary Dewart. Um, what's so remarkable about this involvement is that it was truly representative of town meetings' will. Uh, we have, we're really proud of the maximum options and flexibility that we are providing consumers, and it very much came out of conversations that we've been having with the public regarding the solicitations people are getting from third-party suppliers, rising rates, Eversource raises its rates every six months, as well as the desire to, to have more options to buy renewable energy, uh, certainly at a savings, uh, and uh, to know that it's, a re that it's reliable and locally produced. So we've had all of these objectives we feel that this plan is representative of that range. 
In addition, we're really proud of the significant commitment we can have on environmental impact, uh, and that is namely reducing greenhouse gas emissions townwide. Um, you know, Brookline is actually a climate leader with this program, as you'll see. Other communities do have aggregation programs. They have products where they're offering 5% more additional uh, renewable. But Brookline, as you know, with our 25% product, is going far and above beyond that. And as you'll see, it's more, access more accessible than you might think. Okay, so let me just see if I... Um all right, so this is just to give you a snapshot of where we are right now. So as Selectman Heller said, this is the Town of Brookline's program. It uses bulk purchasing to offer rate stability and renewable energy options to residences and businesses currently on Eversource's basic service. And the intention of our basic product, one of the three in the program, is to provide savings over the contract duration. Town-sponsored program endorsed by the Board of Selectmen, authorized by town meeting. It is vetted, approved, and regulated by the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. And after a competitive bidding process in May, the town selected Dynagy to supply the community's electricity. To clarify, Eversource will still deliver electricity, handle billing, and respond to emergencies. Uh, you may have received your 30-day opt-out notice. It's something that you should pay attention to. There are decisions for you to make. Um, regarding our Chestnut Hill residents, because of a data glitch with Eversource, they don't track the Chestnut Hill customers by zip or by county, and so they were omitted. They just grabbed the Brookline addresses and not the Chestnut Hill ones. So they are, they are updating their files, and those letters should be going out uh, this month. Uh, Chairman Wyshynski, the Board of Selectmen, is sending out a letter to the community um, this week. And as, as you know, we have outreach sessions uh, planned for the entire opt-out period and lots of resources. The purpose of this presentation is to describe the program, who our new supplier is, how we got here, and what resources you have really to make the best decision for your household or business. So just a few basic terms that I, I want to get out of the way. Uh, community choice aggregation is actually a public policy. And as uh, Selectman Heller stated, it's been around since the late 90s, about 20 years. And it does enable cities and towns to aggregate. I talked about bulk purchasing. That concept, you're familiar with it. If you go to Costco or BJ's, when you buy in bulk, you get a cheaper unit price. And that's the idea behind aggregation. The town is authorized to purchase electricity based on pooling all of these residents and businesses, these account holders together. And because we have this great customer base, it becomes really attractive to electricity suppliers who are bidding. And so that's how you get a competitive rate. Uh, it is an opt-out structure that is mandated by the state. Uh, there might be some concern about that, but the rationale is if you have an opt-out structure, you're able to better estimate the upper limit for that, that participation, which is much more attractive uh, to, to bidders. But to accompany that opt-out structure, we have made this plan as flexible as it can be and our outreach sessions are pretty intense to make sure that we are getting the word out so that you can make the best choice for you. Okay, so over 60 communities in Massachusetts participate, about 1,300 nationwide. And um, we're offering, again, we're offering more renewable energy choices than really anyone else nationwide. I think I have a leader in Massachusetts. We're actually a leader with this program nationwide. So just to reiterate and assure you, the Commonwealth regulates aggregation programs to protect consumers. The Commonwealth mandates the opt-out structure, the, the standard 30-day opt-out period, and opting out by mail. The Aggregation Plus, where we use an aggregation program to offer more renewable energy, is actually a really neat idea that was pioneered by the city of Melrose. Uh, Martha Grover is the energy manager there. And she had this ingenious idea that if we want to do more to re reduce carbon emissions, rather than have 
you know, committed people, outliers doing extreme things like installing solar panels or purchasing 100% renewable energy on, on their own, why not have a program where you give people the option of paying just a little bit more and you do that town-wide, you can make just as much of an impact um, compared with a few outliers here and there. So the town of Brooklyn has expanded on that. We pushed the envelope a little bit and as you, as you uh, heard, town meeting was actually overwhelmingly endorsed the idea of offering a product that uh, provided 25% more. Also to make clear, we the town don't receive any fees for providing this service. Little timeline, back in uh, November 2015, town meeting did pass a warrant article authorizing the town to purchase electricity on behalf of residences and businesses, as well as a resolution urging the Board of Selectmen to purchase 25% more renewable energy through an aggregation plan. There was overwhelming support for this, and we feel like this plan does implement the will of town meeting. Uh, April 2016, we conducted a procurement for an aggregation consultant, as no municipality can do this uh, on their own, and we partnered with our regional planning agency, uh, MAPC. The board selected Good Energy. Uh, then in early June of that year, the Board of Selectmen held public hearings on the draft aggregation program, and later that month uh, voted to submit that aggregation plan to DPU for approval. In the fall, DPU held public er hearings at their office uh, on the, the aggregation plan, and it actually took them 10 months. Uh, we were, it takes that long, there were a lot of communities at that time but they do take the due diligence and the consumer protection piece very seriously. Uh, so once DPU approved the aggregation plan, uh, the town did conduct a competitive bidding process with Good Energy, and we selected Dynagy. Okay, I, another, just a little bit on uh, some basic terms that will really help you understand what I'm about to talk about. One good thing about this program is a lot of us, myself included, we don't pay a lot of attention to our electricity bill. We don't really know that there are different charges. Uh, we might not know that we actually have the right to shop for our own electricity suppliers. And so this, this process is really opening up a lot, and I, I think it's encouraging people to pay more attention um, to their rights as consumers. This is a sample bill uh, that you get from Eversource, and if you look at numbers three and four, you'll see that there's a supply charge and a delivery charge. So this is to emphasize that you don't have to have Eversource both supply and deliver your electricity. You can actually shop for your own electricity supplier. And um, so that's what we've done here. Eversource will take care of those power lines. That's how the electricity is delivered. You'll still get one bill from Eversource. What you'll see when you get that bill, that number five, if you participate in the program, it'll say Dynagy. And then your supply rate will, will reflect the, the uh, product that you're in. If you look to the left, number six, you'll get to see your monthly usage from month to month. And then going on to the next page, this is a snapshot of the other side of your bill. Again, there's a distinction between supply, that's the generation of electricity, and delivery, which is the transmission over the power lines and the repair of those power lines. There will be no change in the quality of service. You have an outage, you're going to call Eversource, and you're not going to see any, any change uh, in, that, in that delivery. Now, an important thing to also point out, if you're looking at your current bill, like your June bill, you're going to see Eversource's old rates through June 2017. So again, every six months for residential, they're coming up with new rates. The new rates for the July 2017 to December 2017 period is reflected here, and you read that 10.759 cents per kilowatt hour. So that has gone up from 10.319 cents per kilowatt hour. And I'm just quoting the residential rate. Uh, there are different rates for small commercial industrial and also large. Okay. So, and just one more detail because I find this really helpful. 
most of electricity is produced by burning fossil fuels, and that creates pollution causing greenhouse gases, which contributes to climate change. That does have a measurable impact on the environment and health. A lot of people don't realize that right now, with the electricity you are already getting, the Commonwealth mandates that 12% of all purchased electricity come from renewable resources, and that namely would be sun and wind. Um, so each year, that requirement has to increase by another 1%. What the town has authorized is the purchase of an additional 25% of electricity from new renewable resources. The, the goal is Decreasing our reliance on fossil fuels is the single biggest impact that we can have on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. All right, so finally, we're getting to the program. Okay, now you have three choices. Number one, you do have to be enrolled in one because the state mandates that. Um, the duration of this contract, these are fixed prices for all rate classes from the July 2017 meter read through the December 2019 meter read. Okay, so let's talk about each one. We're gonna start with our basic product, which is Brookline Basic. The only difference, or the main difference uh, amongst the three is really the amount of renewable energy that's added to the amount the state requires. That's the distinction. It's not about level of service. Um, it's not quality of service, it's, it's solely the amount of additional renewable energy. And I like to call them small, medium, and large. So small is our Brookline Basic. It adds no additional renewable energy to the amount the state requires. We got a very competitive rate of 10.398 cents per kilowatt hour. Again, this intends to provide savings over the contract duration, but you need to, to call Dynagy to select it, and the number is right there. Now our standard product, remember we had this resolution passed at town meeting about providing a 25% renewable energy option through an ag plan. So that's what you'd automatically be enrolled in if you do nothing. This adds 25% additional renewable energy to the amount the state requires. You see our base rate of 10.398 cents plus 7 tenths of a penny more. Okay, so a total rate per kilowatt hour is 11.098 cents per kilowatt hour. What does that translate into additional costs? Well, if you're a typical household and you're using, and what I mean by typical is about 600 kilowatt hours per month, that might yield a $2 more a month um, in cost over Eversource's basic service. Now you might not be using that much, so clearly you wouldn't be you wouldn't be paying that. Now another nice provision of this is that whatever you're paying just for the additional renewable energy, there's a tax, a federal tax deduction available. So you can talk to your tax advisor to see if that actually applies to you. But that actually helps defray that additional cost. And as you can see, two dollars more is a lot cheaper than say installing sol solar panels and you're still able to have a great impact town-wide on reducing uh, carbon emissions. So again, you're automatically enrolled if you do nothing. And I call that our medium. So let's go to our large. This is another alternative product called Brookline All Green, and it adds 100% additional renewable energy to the amount the state requires. The breakdown of the rate is that base rate of 10.398 cents, plus 2.8 cents for the renewable energy. Again, there's a tax deduction available for that 2.8 cents. You do need to call Dynagy directly. Um, if you are amongst those who are buying your uh, renewable energy directly from a nonprofit like Mass Energy, you might be paying 3.8 cents for that renewable energy. So keep in mind, you'll still get the same tax benefits that you get through Mass Energy. You'll get that through our program, but it's actually, it'll cost you less, and that's the power of aggregation. Now, you do have another option. You do not have to participate in this program. You can opt out now, and you won't even be enrolled. You just have to return that opt-out form that you got in the mail. That is the procedure. 
If you do participate, you can opt out at any time, and there are no exit fees. The one thing I'd like to caution you, that if you opt out now, and you have buyer's remorse later and say, you know, I really wish I participated, I think my neighbor's getting a good deal, um, if you do that later, you probably will not get the competitive rate. So one option is to try it. You can opt out later, but at least you've, you've got that competitive rate, which cannot be guaranteed if you opt out now and then want to come back in. Okay, so what do you need to do just to sum up? You need to read that opt-out notice. If you don't have it, you can call Dynagy for another copy. You want to decide which option is best for you. So it might be a little complicated, but we're here to provide resources to help you with that decision. Um, but there is really something for everybody, so do take the time uh, to think this through. Then you want to select your option. If you want to select um, Brookline Green, the 25%, that's that medium product, you do nothing. If you want one of the alternatives, Brookline Basic or Brookline All Green, you call Dynagy. Just make sure you have your Eversource account number. You do not need a credit card or anything like that. You just have your Eversource account number and say which product you want. And then finally, if you want to opt out of the three products altogether, just sign and return that opt-out form in the mail. Okay, just an overview of our program benefits. You do have a choice of three products. It's a range of um, objectives to meet customers' needs. Prices are fixed for 30 months, and that does protect consumers from market volatility. Keep in mind, Eversource changes their rates every six months, and we've locked in what we feel is a very competitive rate for 30 months. There's no change in the quality of electricity or customer service. Eversource still delivers. They are responsible for those power lines. If you use a feature like budget bill billing, you get to retain that. That just equalizes your payments every month, so you don't have those wild swings from month to month. If you are on a budget plan or you're a low-income delivery customer, you will retain Eversource's benefits through this program. And again, we have federal, the federal tax deductions are available for the additional renewable energy cost. Again, you can opt out at any time, no early exit fees. The town of Brookline is sponsoring this. We have vetted this supplier with our aggregation consultant, Good Energy. And I want to keep it, I want to just emphasize we are not taking jobs away from Massachusetts, okay? Eversource is based in Dallas. Dynagy is, is based, um, you know, in the Midwest. But to be able to serve New England, these folks need to have power plants in New England. So. The traditional electricity is generated from local power plants, and it's mostly natural gas. Very, very little of it is coal. Uh, the renewable energy is also sourced locally. So Dynagy is going to be purchasing the renewable energy from a nonprofit in Jamaica Plain called Mass Energy. They are the gold standard. They're highly respected. They've been doing this since 1982. Okay, so again, why are we doing this? Electricity <clears throat> consumption is the largest source of pollution causing carbon emissions. And your participation in the standard product, that's the 25% additional renewable energy, will help Brookline displace almost 34 million pounds of carbon dioxide emissions annually. And if you want to think of a concrete equivalent, think of those wind turbines Think of 12 of them being installed instead of relying on fossil fuels. That's the equivalent. And that's the ingenuity behind a program like this. So you think about maybe it costs you $2 more, which could be uh, deducted on your taxes. And you, as a community, can have this degree of impact townwide. Um, that's a great thing. And again, the rest of the country is going to be looking at Brookline because we are really um, the only community offering this much. So we have been hearing from people who really have been praising this program. Frank Caro is a member of the advisory committee. He's also director of the Brookline Community Aging Network. And one of the things that he's been very vocal about really is the amount of solicitations that vulnerable, pe vulnerable people 
have been getting. I personally have spent time with senior citizens clutching bills because they signed up for services that they don't need. No one is helping them read through this, their solicitations. They are vulnerable to what seems to be a good offer. Turns out to be something that's like a three months rate and it's variable. So they, we have firsthand evidence that vulnerable people have been susceptible to solicitations. We assume that research for you and you can rely on the vetting that we've done. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, you might want to do something dramatic like install solar panels, but what if you can't for whatever reason? It could be cost, maybe you don't have that southern exposure. You can, you can participate, we have options in this program that allow you to have more of an impact on the environment in a way that's more budget conscious. That's, so it's, you can be environmentally conscious and budget conscious at the same time. And again, that tax deduction is pretty nice too if you're looking for additional ones. Um, you know, Selectman Heller and Chair Werner Lowy have been really passionate about ensuring that this program is inclusive, that no one is left behind, that this is not an elitist program for some people and not for others. We want to emphasize that Brookline Basic, even if you can't do the 25 or the 100 percent, that Brookline Basic is really offered to be uh, competitive with Eversource's basic service. And we're very proud to offer it to make sure that uh, everyone can take advantage of what aggregation can provide. Okay, and then I think I wanna just, uh, just fixate on this note. The state does have goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And that's uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2050. Now, even though the state is mandating that 12% of electricity supplied come from new renewable resources, at that rate, we are just not going to get there. So that's why we have to do what we can locally. We've come up with a plan that we think will do it without creating burdens on consumers, but will help us push the envelope a little bit toward the state's goal. A little bit about Dynagy. They are one of the nation's largest power companies. They're financially sound Fortune 200 company. They're generating electricity from New England-based power plants, and the majority is natural gas. They have more aggregation accounts nationwide than other suppliers. That was one of our criteria. Um, even though there are hundreds of suppliers that can bid, there are really four um, that just met that, that criteria. They had to be financially sound. They had to have experience with aggregation. They had to have great customer service. Um, another thing, Dynagy is the supplier for other aggregation programs, uh, namely Arlington, Somerville, Sudbury, and Winchester. And I mentioned Mass Energy before, again, local nonprofit and JP. They're, um, they really have been a trusted voice since 1982, and they will be supplying Massachusetts Class I renewable energy certificates. So I've talked to people who do buy 100% renewable energy, and I said, well, where, does, where is it generated? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, I've looked into it. It could be Oregon, it could be Texas. That, if it's not generated locally, you are not reducing your impact, your reliance on fossil fuels. It's important to have local uh, renewable energy so that we can add new renewable energy to our power grid and reduce um, our reliance on fossil fuels. So we have resources. We have a town website, brooklinegreen.com. A letter to the community from the Board of Selectmen is going out this week, and it explains things in a much more friendly, user-friendly manner. That opt-out letter was mandated by the state, and it's, it's pretty bureaucratic. It's a legal document, and it's, um, I think that what you'll get from Mr. Wyshynski explains things in, I think, a friendlier tone. We have frequently asked questions online, uh, information brochures. We're going to be working with Brookline Interactive to post some public service announcements. And the presentations to community groups, these are some of the community groups where we are physically going out into the community, especially amongst our vulnerable population. Um, I will, I've already given one 
um, at the Senior Center. I'm going to be giving another one at the Senior Center. I've gone to Hebrew Senior Life, one of their buildings. I'm going to give two more tomorrow. Reaching out to Brookline Housing Authority if people need translation assistance. We have a fantastic team, and I mentioned their names. They are going out almost door to door uh, doing outreach. And again, um, this really spans a lot of our constituency groups, but in no way is that a complete list. Contact information, again, do come to brooklinegreen.com. Contact the planning department at info at brooklinegreen.com or our main number, 730-2670. Dynagy is our electricity supplier, 866-220-5696. There is an incorrect number on that opt-out letter if you want all green, so please be sure to use the number on the screen if you want to call Dynagy. And keep in mind, Eversource, you have problems with your billing or outages, emergencies, you still want to call Eversource. Okay, now that is it. I'm not sure if the committee has questions or members of the public have questions. I just wanted to add, thank you, Maria. I just wanted to add that there are uh, two more presentations for the general public uh, next week, uh, June 19th at 1.30 in the Putterham Library Community Room, and also uh, Wednesday the 21st of June in the evening at 6.30 also in Putterham. And we've had, this is our second presentation of this in Town Hall, and now we'll have two out in um, the far reaches of Brookline. <laughs> yes. Uh, did, let me yeah. ask community. So, um, Maria, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. Very complete. I just wanted to be clear. Um, when I, if I sign up for the Brookline Hall of Green, mm -hmm. does that mean that all the electricity, 100% total, is renewable sources? Correct. Because the, 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 the wording says the difference among the products is the renewable energy provided in addition to the amount that the state Right. Yep. So remember this. Remember, I talked about that 12 percent. That's called a re renewable portfolio standard, or RPS. So the state, this, it's. I know it's a little difficult to think of. Well, gee, I'm buying 112 percent, but there is an RPS that um, the state requires, and it's 12 percent. Um, so that's the base. That is required. Okay, so what we purchase from Mass Energy isn't going toward that RPS. So the 100% that you purchase, the um, the number of racks basically, um, are are 100%, and that comes from Mass Energy, and we call it additional. It's important to know why it's additional because we're putting new. We're not being redundant and saying whatever you buy, whatever you volunteer to buy is going to fulfill the state's requirement, that 12%, that RPS. So we are adding new. So think of it this way. It's the amount of new electricity, that you're, uh, renewable electricity that you're putting onto the power grid. So think of it that way. That's it. Uh, sir, could you come to the mic and, uh, and identify yourself, if you wouldn't mind? This one, yeah. We're being, t uh, we're being uh, lo streamed on uh, TV, and it'll also be taped for those who want to look at it. So. Okay. I, I will try to be coherent in that case. Um, so I, I have a very similar follow question that the gentleman had uh, about the standard product. Now, uh, does that mean that uh, you add 25 percentage points to the uh, the 12, and so the total is 37 percent energy. Right. Okay. Yes. Now, okay. So, I was um, was in communication with uh, Mr. Leckler, who mentioned that there's an additional 13 percent in there someplace, and then effectively, if you chose the Brookline Green product, you would. Uh, Every, every, uh, if, you know, if you purchase 100 kilowatts, 50 would be from renewable sources, not 37. Is that accurate? I can answer. Okay, uh, yeah, excuse me, could, could you identify yourself, I think, I'm for sorry, the sorry, uh, uh, David Danning, 11 Clark Road. Okay, thank you, Mr. Danning. Okay, so I, we're talking about Massachusetts Class 1 Renewable Energy Certificates. There are other things that the state actually requires that's part of that RPS. One is a solar carve out. You might hear of communities buying SRECs. That's different. It's a kind of a subset, 
but it's the the solar carve out is actually separate from the 12 percent it's like another 4.5 percent and that's a mandatory that's that's the um the state saying okay so your renewable energy mass uh, massachusetts class one can come from you know hydropower it can come from wind it can come from sun the solar carve out the 45 percent in addition to the 12 it's actually a way of saying that you have to have um, some coming from solar and then there's actually class two renewable energy certificates and that would be class two renewable it's that's that's electricity generated from sources that were constructed prior to 1997 so new renewable energy is is generated from sources that were constructed post 1997 the state actually wants to make use of those older sources uh, generation sources and that's what is called the class um, class two RECs or renewable energy certificates that adds like another 2.6 percent to the RPS and then there's finally the class two waste energy and that adds I think another 3.5 percent so just to make it simple like if you were to add all of that up it's like a total the RPS standard is like 18 percent or so if you think about all of those different components the reason why we just talk about the 12 percent we are purchasing class one uh, renewable energy certificates so it's we're not buying s racks we're but so just to make it easier to describe we're talking about massachusetts class one and that's the 12 percent that the um the state requires so i hope it's I'm not sure if it's confusing, but the reason why we're focusing on the class one is that adds new renewable energy resources uh, to, to the power grid. So it's not incorrect to talk about 12% versus the other 13. It's just a little easier um, because of what we're purchasing for renewable energy. So your, just, just, just to ask the bottom line Sir, question. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have to ask yeah. you to go to the mic. I think I could repeat his question if you just want to. So that I, could repeat, I could repeat the question. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Just to ask the bottom line question mm -hmm. on, the, on the green. Yep. So when, when the dust clears, roughly 50% of your, your electricity would be generated from renewable sources. Roughly, yes. And, and on the all green product, 100% of your purchased electricity would be generated from renewable sources. Yeah, that's actually, you'd be, it'd be uh, higher than 100% because of that RPS. So you just think of it as the amount of uh, renewable energy uh, that you're adding to the power grid. It's kind of hard, it's a hard concept to grasp when it's over 100%. Um, but, but yes. Is there another question? Yes, Mr. Bowen. I am Craig Bowen, 127 Fuller Street, Town Meeting, Precinct 8. I have uh, three simple questions, um, and I'm not looking for an answer at this meeting. I'm looking for an answer put online. The questions that I'm getting from my neighbors are, what exactly did Brookline specify <coughs> As, as the requirements to bid on this program. What companies bid on it and what did they bid? Okay, so we, we can provide you with that information. Um, one of the things that we specified is we wanted to be able to beat Eversource's prices. It, we would have been very reluctant to accept any bids that uh, did not beat Eversource's rates for the July 2017 to December 2017 period. And that's why we waited for Eversource to come up with their new rates and not go out to bid before then. So that was one thing. There were four um, bidders. Of course, one was Dynagy. There was Constellation. Um, there was Syria. And there was a fourth that, I, that always escapes me. I'm not sure if Warner. Um, we can provide that information for you. Not a problem whatsoever. Um, I'm hoping you can put it online. Yes. Now there's a. But yes. Now there's a reason why it doesn't go. I mean, communities don't put it online. We don't want to jeopardize other communities who are going out to bid. So it's really, um, it's a very volatile market. So it's not that we're keeping. 
any of this information. It's we're just trying to be respectful of fellow communities that are going out to bid. If they see our rates, um, there could be some kind of issue. So we're just trying to be respectful of the bidding process that other communities have. They have different consumer bases. It's not apples and oranges. Um, and a lot of these electricity suppliers are also bidding there as well. So that's, that's the only reason, but happy to provide it. I can s tell you that Dynagy was by far and away the bidder with the lowest rates. No question about that, by far and away. So we were extremely thrilled um, that they were so competitive and we were very eager to lock them in uh, for 30 months. And I'm not sure, well, Lauren, I'd I like to add that uh, Good Energy is our broker, vetted the, the energy companies and they said to us, look, uh, there are these companies that are good that, that do a better job in, con in consumer service. They do a better job in uh, uh, providing um, uh, rate stability. That they, you know, they're a Fortune 200 company, et cetera. And we don't want to fly by night. We don't want to send you to a fly by night. So just as uh, the town of Brookline uh, qualifies bidders for various things, uh, we qualified the bid here so that we got uh, the top-notch uh, companies to bid and Dynagy came in considerably lower than the others. Um, it may be because Dynagy wants to break into the New England market. It's really a Western company and even though it has power plants here, it doesn't really have very many consumers here. So maybe that was the reason. I can't say. but. We do know that we did get a very good rate from a very good company. Don. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Maria, for, for mm -hmm. this presentation. Um, uh, two questions, which I hope are simple. Um, what happens at the first question is what happens at the end of the 30 months? Can mm -hmm. you describe that pro process? Right. Briefly? So we would be able to go out to bid again. Now, if we were to go out to bid again, then consumers would be getting another opt-out notice so that you are not getting slipped into another program. This process resumes completely. So it, it would repeat. And, and suppose, it's, for instance, yeah. that the bids came in higher than Eversource uh, at the end of 30 months. Um, again, you know, it's it's really hard to project then, but our goal is really to like always beat Eversource. And keep in mind, we are very attractive to electricity suppliers. <laughs> so we have a great uh, customer base, the size of Brookline. We also have a great load factor. We don't use as much energy as we could. Um, so our load factor is high, and that's what you want. So we're very attractive to bidders, and there is incentive to provide Brookline with a competitive rate. And certainly, if you know people participate in the program, that also helps us attract competitive rates. And the second question is, um, has anybody done like the back of an envelope calculation uh, as to uh, what percentage of the town's uh, carbon footprint would be reduced? Uh, by yeah, adoption of this yes, program. I think it was, and I'm not sure if it was Alan Levitin who I, I and Tommy Vitola, and it was about four percent. Four percent. Four percent townwide. Mm -hmm. I forgot to ask you to identify yourself. I'm Don <laughs> Okay. Uh, anyone else have a question? Any of the committee members? Anybody in the audience? No. You all know exactly what you're going to do. <laughs> Okay. All right. I want to add one other thing, uh, one other point uh, that I didn't make when I answered Craig's question before, and that is that um, I mean we've all gotten these solicitations in the mail from other electric companies, you know, say, oh, we've got, we're going to give you a low rate, we're going to do this for you, we're going to do that for you, but who has the time to go and investigate, you know, whether that company really has the business plan, does it have the uh, stability and the financing? We, as an individual consumer, we can't do that. It's just too much work. And so I end up standing over my recycle bin and throwing those things away. This is an opportunity for you to understand that we've hired a broker, 
a person, a company that is specialist in this area to do this kind of work for us so that we can take comfort in the fact that when we're signing up for this program, it has been well vetted and um, we don't have to worry about whether it's a stable company and whether it has the financing and whether it has the knowledge, et cetera. So that's another huge advantage to uh, an aggregation program like this. Okay, uh, Maria, thank you very much. My pleasure. Very, very good presentation, and I appreciate all, all of your hard work. And if you have any questions, Maria's phone number is the one that's listed there under planning and department, so. <laughs> and she's very willing to talk. Thank you all for coming. Okay, well, we could adjourn, or we could use the few more minutes we have to um, talk more about uh, some of the issues we were engaged in before. Um, I know a couple of people have to leave, so, uh, but um, how do we want to prepare for the July meeting? Um, I guess is if, assuming we will have one, assuming we will have a quorum, um, are we going, what, which of these things are we going to uh, focus on? Uh, Maria's told us that the vulnerability and assessment and action plan will be coming to us and will probably be ready in August. So, um, um, I will probably have an update regarding the Green Communities Grant. That's the $250,000 grant that we apply for every year, and we've been lucky to uh, be granted an award. I think the awards are gonna, going to be announced next week. Um, so there's that. Uh, the Net Zero um, Ninth School Committee is working on recommendations, so um, there might be an update there. And um, I think for um, really July, there might be just some follow-up regarding uh, Brookline Green Electricity. It just might be a chance to give some feedback and indicatives of how the success of the program, how it resulted. Okay, and also on the EV, uh, I think we need to decide whether we want to pursue that. We've, we've met our obligation in providing a quite extensive report that it does make recommendations and uh, possibly we would want to pursue some of those recommendations. Do we know if uh, Scott Ananian, who was the previous warrant article petitioner, plans to... Uh, do another warrant article based on this, or is he expecting that, that we will work on one, or? I, I think, uh, well, he's, from our, in discussions I've had with him, he's, he's moving into other topics, but also felt that, you know, we've done a very good job with this, and uh, would like maybe to work with us on, on recommendations. I know in our last meeting we discussed possibilities of coming back with a warrant article. Uh, maybe, Maria, you could explain. Sure. That. Yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, Linda's not here, and Linda was the chair of the subcommittee. In a nutshell, we felt that the most effective way would be to update our zoning bylaw to create some awareness and um, not re require uh, developers of major impact projects to install level two electric vehicle charging stations, but to encourage and to provide provisions, namely it could be an, under a major impact projects, you do have to dovetail with the Department of Public Works regarding a transportation demand management plan and a transportation study. And there could be recommendations that come from the Director of Engineering and Transportation that can say, you know, this is where you could be meeting the needs of the occupants of your facility by installing, or at least, you know, installing level two uh, charging stations. So that is actually a really, that would be a great step in that direction. The reason why we wouldn't require is that not every facility has a need for it. Um, one thing that we would like to see happen is a best practices guide to really encourage developers to provide that provision. Um, so, you know, if an outcome is changing our bylaw, then we would want to submit a warrant article. 
at the town meeting. So this would be a way that the developers were looking to uh, seek approval. Uh, they could get sort of credit or points or... We don't know the exact mechanism. I mean, keep in mind that if the director of engineering is making a recommendation regarding um, a major impact project, a developer is much more inclined um, to to work with um, those provisions. And it's a really strong document because it travels with, it's part of the conditions in a ZBA decision. And that travels, that gets filed with the registry. So that's enforceable. So even though we're not changing our bylaws to require installation, the end result is you do have something that's enforceable and that uh, does get filed at the registry. So. Deborah. sort of update you right now, which is we had a meeting um, last week uh, and Ray Masek, who is you know, one of the project managers for the building department, was there and he, at that meeting, talked about how um, the, just the day before he had had the uh, sort of informational meeting with the architects that are likely to bid on the high school and had uh, explained the Warren article to them. So the basic thing is that I mean, the, 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 I guess the, the, the magic of this thing being a resolution is that uh, even though the whereas clause that dealt specifically with the high school was much more general and that the initial focus was on the ninth school, that because there was that there is that whereas clause, it's, uh, we feel that you know town staff are applying it to both. There's not any sense. It's, it's, uh, oh. it's just the ninth school. So there, there's a process for selecting an architect HMFA isn't necessarily going to continue beyond Correct. Okay. Yeah, when you when you go for each phase, you you put out a you know what's called an RFQ, request for qualifications. And so we've had quite a number of uh, people uh, or firms express interest. So oh. now they're forming a committee of seven. That's part of this process. That's correct. The committee of seven uh, has been formed and um, we will be meeting uh, to review. First, we review the applications and rank them and schedule interviews. We interview the architects and then uh, select one. And HMFH could apply and, and I think has, but I haven't seen the uh, applications yet. But. I assume that those are you know, under the open meeting law, are public meetings, but that they're probably not public in the sense that the public can't ask questions or anything. Correct. Uh, you know, well, we've never had throngs of people attend them, no. Well, usually they're pretty boring, <laughs> but except for the committee members who are there. Yeah. Another, yeah. My memory of the, of the uh, committees of seven is that the questions that get asked and, and the kind of screening is really basically a function of, of the seven people that, that, who are in, in the room, that there aren't published guidelines for this. Is there any way to... That's correct. Um, I'm actually the chair of this committee of seven, and there because I'm the co-chair of the uh, Brookline High School uh, Expansion Advisory Committee. Um, the other members are there are three members from the school committee and three members from the building commission. We're the three agencies that are charged with the management of the project. Um, so, so, so these questions of, of qualifications vis-a-vis. Rebuilding experience, etc. Uh, design. Uh, um, would you be the point person on on those questions? I could be. That's uh, for sure, and I will be sure to ask questions yes. of that nature. Do you think it oh. might be just sort of quietly helpful if some members of the green community were sitting in the audience watching? Um, you could. I think the most. You know, I I plan to bring with me a copy of the resolution, and uh, make sure that the all of the companies are familiar with that resolution and that they are prepared to meet that meet its terms. Um, I know we talk sometimes in town meeting about how, well, it's just a resolution, but in town hall we take those resolutions seriously. We took the resolution on, on uh, community aggregation very seriously, as you know, 
and there will be, you know, no less serious purpose for this one, as well as the one on the Paris Agreement or any of the resolutions that, that have passed town meeting. So, so um, have those interviews been scheduled yet? Do you have a rough idea when they're going to be? Or no, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll probably have a better idea Thursday. Could I pursue that just a little sure. bit more on the committees at 7? Um, I mean, the building uh, commission is, I mean, they always have seats. Three, three seats three at the seats. table, as well as the using agency, which in this case is the school committee. Um, and I'm just wondering, in, in terms of future and, and whatever building projects going around town, um, to somehow memorialize the kinds of questions and qualifications we want to ask on the environmental front, um, memorialize it within the building commission or whatever, but just to make sure that the, that perspective is, is always there. Um, well, again, again, we have to rely on uh, I, on members of the committee, as you know, but also the staff. But that's certainly, um, you, you know, the staff is very well aware. Ray Masak and uh, Tony Quigley. Tony has been managing the devotion project, and that project came in uh, with a very, very good um, user. Uh, what? Yeah, uh, energy user intensity, exactly, uh, index, if you will, or points. And uh, so we would expect that this project also will uh, be uh, very, uh, very, have a very close eye on energy. Now, Ray Masak, who's been uh, our project manager, has uh, attended many of the net zero meetings, I believe, and uh, is well aware of the provisions of it. And um, understands them yeah, he's well. Very supportive of it. Yeah. So I mean, the, I'm the not I'm not worried that, about it. The other thing that I mean, it's a complex process. I don't know that I understand it, but your question also sort of perhaps relates to the fact that the building commission bylaw was amended by town meeting a number of years ago, specifically saying that there should be environmental goals and objectives um, set in the, in, in the program. That, um, that the architects work from and exactly how that fits into the process. I, I think there's, I, I don't entirely understand it, but that's another way of looking at it, make sure that, 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 that people are reminded of that occasion. Yeah, actually, I, I worked on it with Sergio years ago. And uh, when uh, projects are uh, presented for any degree of uh, funding at that town meeting, There's another aspect of this. It was uh, Scott Englander's presentation or at uh, the Warrant 21 uh, deliberation that I thought was penetrating, and we really need to come back and keep that in mind because he's looking at the calculation of, of uh, payback as opposed to factoring in the savings on operational side as well. Uh, so. That's been the problem, I think, and um, we should, you know, use this process. To Actually, sure what Scott that. Engler pointed out was that a simple payback analysis is mm -hmm. fairly primitive, but if you do an internal rate of return analysis or net present value analysis, you may you may sometimes get a different answer. I'm delighted that you brought that up because I would love to get a one or two page presentation of just the details of, he, of, it's of what beautiful, it. it's elegant. I asked him for a copy and I'll be happy to send it to you. I, th that would be wonderful. <laughs> I, I would love to Maybe you could send it to us all. Yes. Pardon? You could send it to the committee. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're at the seven thirty mark. Uh anyone have anything else to add or um so we'll we'll move forward on our plan for we'll do a doodle poll for July and for August. And then in September I guess we would start talking about how uh, we would fit the vulnerability action plan in with the CAP plan and, and work forward from there. Okay. Move we adjourn. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you to those people who attended. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Hi. I meant to like.